Well, hey, welcome to Elevate. We're so glad that you're here. My name is Devin Farney, and I am the executive pastor here at Elevate Church. I love this church. It's been my home church for 10 years, which is a super long time, yes. Now, my husband and I have been married for seven years, and we are so thankful for pastors Brian and Danielle, who just celebrated 24 years of marriage. Yes, that's a big deal. They've been amazing mentors and leaders in our lives, both as pastors and bosses, but also just as friends and mentors. And they are truly such a good picture of what a godly marriage looks like, and we're so thankful for them. So can we honor our pastors for just a moment and thank them? Well, me and my husband, we have two daughters. Um, They are so much fun. We have a almost one-year-old Rose and an almost three-year-old Ruthie. Um, And this week, I made a mistake and I brought glitter in the house. And um, yeah, my husband's still a little uh, sour with me about that. There is glitter all over our couch. And one thing I love about little girls is they're so fun. There's glitter and there's pink and there's bows and there's all these fun things. Um, But something I love about having kids is you learn a lot about yourself. Um, You learn all your good qualities. Like Ruthie, she is strong-willed. She has great leadership. She's funny. She likes to sing and dance and she lights up a room. She got all that from me. And then she also can be pretty bossy. She throws fits when she doesn't get her way. Um, You know, typical toddler behavior, but she gets all of those from Brian, not me, it's from him. No, she's completely me. But what I love about kids is that they truly do teach you a lot about yourself. And I know that God has used my kids in so many ways that I have heard things that I needed to hear, understood things I needed to hear just from that moment when I needed a hug or I needed to remember that Jesus wants to be my friend forever or different things. My kids always come through with that and I love that. And we've been in this series called Hearing From God where we've been talking about leaning into what God has for us. Now I am someone that grew up going to church and when I was about 11 years old, my mom and my dad got divorced. Now they were like the picture perfect family. They were so, uh, they were really good at hiding all of their issues. When they got a divorce, I thought they were joking. I told my friends and they thought I was lying to them because my parents had it all together to, to me. And so in seventh grade, they decided to get a divorce. And when they did that, uh, they told me a few days after Christmas, because they didn't want to ruin Christmas, but I now always associate with Christmas. So, you know, tomato, potato, I guess. But they, um, they told me right after Christmas, and I was supposed to go to a church lock-in that next night. And I had a friend coming. I was so excited. She didn't go to church, so I was so excited to get to bring my friend to church. And I was devastated with this news, but I knew that my friend was excited, and it was a big deal, so I was like, no. I'll still go. I remember calling her and saying, hey, uh, my parents just got a divorce. I'm really upset. And she was really kind because she had just been through that. And we were still excited. So we went and we got to the church lock-in. And my youth pastor, Kathy, she was so wonderful, so kind. And I remember all the kids were playing games and I was kind of sad. I was just kind of sitting there by myself. And I remember her sitting down with me And she was just like, hey, how you doing? She's just kind. And I remember just talking to her about what was going on, how I was feeling. And the funny thing about this conversation is I would say that this conversation truly set me up to make a decision of, hey, I'm going to keep following God. Even though things are hard right now, I want to stay connected to church. I want to stay connected to God because there's people that love me. And so because of that conversation, I knew that that's where I wanted to be. I knew that I wanted to be in God's house day in and day out, even though I was sad, even though I was hurt, even though I felt a little lost. And the funny thing about all of it is I do not remember a single word that she said to me. I don't remember anything profound. I don't remember her saying anything that like changed my whole life, but I just remember how she made me feel. I remember her just looking me in the eye, listening to me, asking me questions, and I just remember feeling heard, feeling loved, feeling cared for. And 
we have a duty, church, parents, to get our kids into the places and the spaces to meet Jesus, to get them around people who love Jesus, to get them in places to make good friends, to get them in places to hear from God. And maybe for you, maybe you're an older parent and you're like, well, that ship has sailed for me. Hey, if you have grandkids, if you're someone in this church that maybe kids is not your journey, that's okay. But there is a church full of people with kids that need you. We do something called child dedications and we take a, a thing as a church where we say, hey, we're gonna help raise this kid in the church. You're a part of that. And if you're a parent of kids, it's so important that we take ownership and that we get our kids in the house. Because the reality is, is from zero, from birth to 18, you have 936 Sundays with them. And yes, there are 936 gumballs in here. I know you're wondering. There are, I counted them. Um, but 936 Sundays, that's how many days that you have. Now, let's say, realistically, that's a lot. That's if you came every single Sunday. Now, if you missed four a year, let's say 864, that puts you about here. But a lot of us don't even come that. A lot of us already missed our first four Sundays in February. We were already, that was already taken from us, right? And that's okay. But it's so important that we are getting our kids in the house. But most of us don't have babies. Most of us might be more here. Five-year-olds, you have 676 Sundays left. If you have a nine-year-old, 438. If you have a 16-year-old, 104. That's how many Sundays you have before they turn 18, they go off to college, and they go do their own thing, and you hope and you pray that you did everything you needed to do to help them discover God's plan for them. And the thing is, is that the relationships that they make on Sundays and Wednesdays are the ones that are gonna matter, are the ones that they are gonna carry with them. And it is your responsibility, parents, friends, that you do that. Now, if you're in here today and you feel like you failed your kids, you need to hear this. You didn't fail. And there's still time. You still have time <clears throat> to keep doing what you can. You still have time to keep praying for them, to keep bringing them to the house. You didn't fail. You still have time. God's not done with them and he's not done with you either. But we know that by age nine, most kids have already made up their mind about their spiritual beliefs. By age nine, that's crazy. By age nine, they've already made up their minds. They've already decided what they're gonna believe. And 90% of adults that go to church now grew up in church. That tells you that even if, let's say, your kids fade away from church for a little bit, a lot of times they will come back. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, train up your child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Maybe you're in here today and you feel like, man, they did depart from it. I, I got them to church. I did all that I could do. But here's the thing. If you're getting them into church every week and you're building that into them, you're prioritizing that, maybe they faded away from that. But as they get older, they're gonna come back. I believe that. I believe that what you did wasn't wasted. I believe what you invested into them wasn't wasted. I believe that God is gonna use that. Maybe for you, you have little kids like me. I know it's so easy to say, oh, well, we're just not feeling good this weekend. Or, oh, we have this or that going on. But I can tell you right now, those first five years are crucial in getting them into God's house. And them understanding that it's a priority and them understanding why it's important. And there's a story in the Bible that when I was growing up, when my parents were going through the divorce, that was really important to me, that I loved. Because it's one of the only times that you really see Jesus as a boy. It's really one of the only few times that we hear about Jesus' childhood. And it's found in Luke 2, 41 through 52. And it starts off that every year, Jesus and his parents went to Jerusalem for a big festival. 
We could call this festival Pumpkin Fest. <laughs> no, they didn't have that back then. But they went to a festival together. And so Jesus and his family and their neighbors and their friends, they would all travel together to these festivals. And after the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth. But Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among, among the relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching everywhere. But why did you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all of the people. Now, I love this story because it teaches us, it shows us some truths about what we need to be doing, what we need to teach our kids and what us as adults need to be doing in our own lives. And it breaks down three main areas. And the first question, I think that it shows all of us is, hey, what do you prioritize? What are you prioritizing in your life? When we look at this story, they found him in the temple. Jesus wanted to be in God's house. He was prioritizing that. There was a festival going on. There was probably a lot of fun happening, a lot of things that he would wanna do. But he prioritized being in the temple. What things have we been prioritizing over getting to God's house? And it's easy. I'm not here to shame you or make you feel bad. You're here today. That's awesome. But it's so important that we're prioritizing that. And the thing is, is whether you have kids, whether you just have people in your life that you want to find Jesus, how you prioritize things and how you model that and live that out speaks way more than just telling people. Way more is caught than it ever is taught. Someone that sees you faithfully going to church, faithfully serving the Lord, faithfully posting about it, talking about it, living out these things, not just talking about it, but living it out. That is a way more powerful invite than just constantly asking people over and over and over again. We have to ask ourselves, hey, do I really believe this? Am I really living this out? Or am I just going through the motions, pretending, oh yeah, church is important, but we see you every six weeks. And then we wonder why our kids aren't prioritizing that. And the hard truth, parents, is you have to lead the way in that. I know that sometimes they don't wanna come. I know that it was a rough night. I have a toddler that's up like eight times a night. We don't really sleep anymore. I don't even know what sleep is. But you make it a priority. Because at the end of the day, I think sometimes we flip these two things. We think, Capacity determines priority. Oh, if I just have, if I, I can only do so much, so we'll have to decide from there. No, no, no. Your priorities determine your capacity. What you make time for is what you're gonna have time for. What you prioritize is what you're gonna make time for and do. If coming to God's house is not a priority for you, you're never gonna make it happen. You're never gonna come. You're only gonna come when, well, we have nothing else to do. It was really nice weather, so we wanted to go away for the weekend. And I get that, but what about the other weeks? Because I can tell you this, the longer you stay away from church, the harder it is to come back. The more times that you kind of just, well, we're just gonna sleep in this weekend. Well, we had plans that weekend, and then we had a game the next weekend, and then we just kind of didn't feel like it. And soon it's been six weeks, and we haven't even seen you. And I just wanna encourage you that maybe that's been you and that's okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. Make a change now, declare, hey, we're gonna start prioritizing this stuff. We're gonna start making a point because our actions and what we're prioritizing matters because we don't have a lot of weeks left with these kids. We don't have a lot of time left to show them this, to model this for them. 
And the thing that I love about Elevate is that we have so many opportunities to do this together. It's not something where, yes, on Sundays, we wanna encourage you to be in here and take your kids into eKids because it's amazing and because they're gonna learn about Jesus in a way that is applicable for them. But hey, we also have opportunities where you can do this together. A great opportunity coming up is the Pumpkin Festival. You can sign up today to serve at the grill, to walk in the parade, to get your shirt. You can jump on the app. And I wanna encourage you to do that because there's so many ways that you can serve as a family. And that's one of the best ways that you can model that to your kids is by doing it together. Because that's the best way to say, hey, this is important. Not by just telling them, but showing them. By making it a priority in your life. The second thing that I love about this story is it asks us the question, hey, how are you connecting? When we look at Jesus, he was sitting among the religious leaders and teachers and he was asking questions. It's important to get in God's house, connect in a place where you and your kids feel safe to ask questions. Because the reality is, is we don't want kids to have your faith. We want them to find their own faith because if they're only carrying your faith, it will not last. It won't. They'll go out on their own because it wasn't ever theirs. And so the best thing that you can do is get your kids in the places and spaces to carry their own faith, to understand what they believe. Get them to youth ministry on Wednesday nights. They have circles, they have time where they have a safe place with leaders who love Jesus to ask questions to understand their faith, to understand what they're going through. In eKids, they have circles every week where they have time to sit with leaders who love them, who care about them, and ask questions. We look at Jesus. I think sometimes we think that we aren't allowed to ask questions about our faith. And in fact, questions are what help us understand our faith, to have a deeper faith. And that's on you to put yourself in a space where you can do that. Towards the end of September, we'll be launching Circles. If you haven't already signed up for that, if you haven't filled out a card yet, if you have, hey, you're on a list, you're gonna be getting that as we roll out Circles in the next few weeks. But if you haven't, hey, I wanna encourage you to fill out something today. Take it to the Welcome Home Desk. Because you need to be in a place where you can be with people that love Jesus ask questions, understand your faith more, make friends. Maybe you're finding yourself in a place where you just don't have good friends right now. Hey, how are you connecting? A great way to connect too is through serving. Maybe you don't have time right now. You're like, man, I just don't know if I could make another night of the week work. Hey, serve, get around people. We also need people that are gonna serve kids and serve students. Some of the best leaders of this church are people that don't have kids and then they go and they serve kids, they serve students and they're, they're the favorites in the room. The funny thing about my leader, Kathy, Kathy was not the cool 20 something. We need those, those are great. Kathy was 55 years old and she was awesome. I loved Kathy because she was kind. She always showed up. I knew she was gonna be there. She was always ready with a smile. She brought baked goods a lot, which who doesn't love baked goods? Come on. But she was an amazing leader. And maybe for you, you count yourself out because you're like, I'm not cool enough to be with you. They aren't gonna like me. Heck, they just want someone that's gonna listen to them and that cares about them. Maybe on the surface, they want the cool people, but that's not really what they want. They just wanna feel loved. They just wanna feel cared for. They wanna know that you know their name. That's what they care about. And if you feel like you can do that, hey, I wanna invite you to sign up to serve for youth and for kids because we need awesome leaders that just wanna love on our kids and on our students. And maybe for you, that's your next step. You're like, man, I think I, think I could do that. I think I could love on some youth and love on some kids. And the last thing is we have to ask ourselves, who do you serve? When we look at Jesus, when he went that day, he said, didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God. 
When we prioritize God, when we prioritize our connection, when we prioritize who we serve, we gain favor with God. We grow in wisdom. We grow in our faith. We grow in being able to reach people and make disciples by doing those things, by staying focused, and then by passing that on to our kids, on to our parents that we've been praying for to come to know Jesus, on to everyone around us. In Joshua 24, 15, it's a verse that you see everywhere. The very end of it says, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And the thing I love about this verse is I think a lot of times we just look at the end of it. But if you look at the full verse, Joshua is urging the people to turn away from idols, to turn away from other gods. It's not just a verse declaring what they're gonna do, but it's also saying, hey, here's what we're not gonna do. And you can make a choice what world you wanna live in. But as for me, this is what we're gonna do. And I think in our houses, in our families, we have to make that same declaration. It means that we have to set boundaries. It means that we have to look at the idols in our lives that are taking our time, the idol of money, the idol of time. What are those things? The idol of technology. What are those things that are keeping you from being able to really lean in to what God has for you and for your family? Because we all have idols. We all have things that are taking time away from God and our relationship with him. And as a family, you have to say, hey, not only are we gonna declare that we're gonna serve the Lord, but hey, what are those things? What boundaries do we have in place to keep us on track, to keep us safe? to make sure that we're doing those things. Hey, we're, we're not gonna gossip in this house. Hey, we're not gonna do sports that take us away from church on a Sunday morning. We're gonna tell our coaches, hey, we can't do Wednesday nights. They have youth. We're gonna do things a little bit differently that may make us the weird family, that may make us look different. Hey, our kids aren't gonna have cell phones at the same time everybody else does. Whatever that looks like for you, and I'm not saying those have to be your boundaries, but hey, it's so important that we set those and we say, hey, we're gonna be a little different because as for me and my family, we're gonna serve the Lord. And it's important that we teach our kids those and that we help them understand them because anyone can get behind a why. If they understand the why, they're gonna come back to it. Because after those 936 Sundays are over, they go out into the world and you pray a lot, and you hope that you did a good job, and they will probably fail a little bit. That's just what's gonna happen. But you pray that what you did every Sunday and what you did every week and what you did every day and praying with them and showing them God's word and getting them to youth and all of those things, you pray that every single one of those Sundays mattered. And you say, God's got them. They're in God's hands. I did all I could with what I was entrusted with. And that's all God asks of us. Do the best you can with what you have. And maybe today you're feeling discouraged, but you need to know that, hey, we're praying with you. If you have that kid that maybe you feel like you did that, hey, God still got them. They're in his hands. And the work that you did wasn't wasted. My mom worked really, really hard to raise me in the church and even before she was a single mom, when I was four years old, my dad never wanted to go to church. He never went with us. But my mom made it such a priority in our house. She made sure that every single Sunday we were at church. When I was four, I looked up at the stage and I said, Mom, I wanna sing. Shocker, I know. And that next Sunday, she made sure that I was in that little white robe with the red bow and the cherub choir. She made sure that I got every opportunity to serve God and get to know him. And she worked her tail off to make sure she was growing in her faith so that I could grow in mine. And every Sunday we went to church and it was a big deal. And she would be the first to tell you that she was not the perfect mom, she made mistakes, but I'd be the first to tell you that she did the most important thing for me. And that was helping me find my relationship with God. And as I got older and I went to college, I made some mistakes. I didn't always make the best decisions. I kind of faded away 
from my relationship with God for a little bit. And then right out of college, I had a friend that reached out to me out of the blue. We hadn't talked in a bit. And she invited me to this conference and then invited me here to Elevate. And after a year of telling her no, I finally told her yes. And God used Elevate to change my life. And the thing that's the most amazing about it is the friend that invited me was the friend that I invited to that lock-in when I was 12 and my parents were divorcing and I was in the hardest time of my life and it was so important to me to make sure that she knew Jesus. And then in the end, she wanted to make sure that I knew Jesus. And it's amazing how God will work. And that's why it's so important that we connect our kids to people that later on will reach out for them. Leaders that are gonna care enough to say, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. Where are you? Because parents, it's hard. It's hard to be a parent. But you need to know that you're not alone. We don't expect you to do this alone. Look around. This is your family. These are people that are here for you, that love you. And it's hard when you feel like we failed. It's hard when you have sleepless nights because your toddlers don't sleep. It's hard when you're going through potty training and it's awful. But you have people around you. And that's why it's so important that you prioritize this in your life. It's so important that you make this day a priority that you bring back the Lord's day, that you make this your Sabbath, that you don't just say you love God, but you show it. And that ultimately that you declare over your family, hey, as for me and my family, we are gonna serve the Lord. Here's what we're not gonna do and here's what we are gonna do. Here's what's gonna help us do this so, so well. And if you're in here today and you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, I wanna give you that opportunity now You need to know that God sent his son Jesus to die for you. You need to declare that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. It's not a prayer that saves you, but it's the faith saying, I'm giving my life fully and completely to Jesus. I know I need saving and I have a Savior that is good. Let's pray. God, we thank you for being a God that loves us so much. We thank you for being a God that has our back, a God that gives us people in our lives to love us and to care for us. God, I pray that you will surround our kids, that you will protect our kids, that you will help us to continue to prioritize getting them to the house, even when it's hard, even when we feel like the weird family with boundaries. God, I pray that you encourage us to be different, so that we can follow you and that we can help our kids to know you better. And God, we wanna give our lives to you. There's people in here that don't know you yet. And if you're ready to give your life to Jesus, would you just slip up your hand right now? Thank you. We've sinned, we've messed up, God but we're ready to start living our life for you. Help us to live for you. We believe that you sent Jesus to die for us and we confess that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. We love you, God, and we pray all of these things in your name. Amen.